All right. So I think it jumped a couple ahead. Let me go ahead and get back. There we go. So our agenda tonight, we are going to do a couple announcements, um, but only a couple because we want to get to our fabulous speaker, Megan Rennie, as soon as we can. Uh, then we're going to do some Q&A about um, her topics tonight. And then, as always, we'll end with some breakout room networking. So if you haven't already, definitely follow us on all of our social media channels. We are all over the place. Um, if you're not following us yet, um, definitely check it out. Um, our, our YouTube page is really important because that's where we're going to post the recording. I know a couple of you have mentioned this already um, if we're going to post it. And yes, we will. So make sure you're following us on YouTube. Um, also, check out our website. It's uxresearchandstrategy.com. That's where we'll post our slides as well uh, later and any resources that we may have. So uh, make sure you're checking us out for all of our future events. All right, like I mentioned before, at the end of um, our meeting tonight, we are going to do some networking um, in different breakout rooms and we will let you know ahead of time if this is super scary to you, you can drop out. Um, but we definitely encourage you to, to stay with us, make connections. You never know when a connection is going to help you out in your career or personal life. So um, we've gotten some great feedback from, from these sessions and we encourage you to stay. We do have prompts, so you will have a specific topic to talk about um, if just chatting with strangers is scary to you as well. So definitely stay for that. It's a lot of fun. Um, we do have an upcoming event in November 12th for World Usability Day. So the theme of uh, this year's World Usability Day is artificial intelligence and human-centered design. Um, for this event, we have two uh, headlining speakers, which is gonna be great. We'll have Amanda Dorsey from Capital One and Carol Smith from Carnegie Mellon. You definitely don't want to miss that one. It's gonna be amazing. Um, events, uh, the tickets are um, available on Eventbrite. So if you just go in Eventbrite and search um, UX Research and Strategy, you should be able to find it. Uh, we'll also post the link um, here in the chat. Also on November 17th, we actually have two events in November, which is great. Um, and this one was a, a thank you event for the North Texas Giving Day we did um, uh, last month. So this is with Indy Young, um, who is a huge leader in the field, um, especially when it comes to um, mental models and personas. Um, so this is a fireside chat with her Q and A. Um, we gave out free or we gave out tickets to those who um, donated um, at least fifty dollars to us for North Texas Giving Day. So it was a big thank you. Um, and North Texas Giving Day is over, but if you do donate $50 or more still, we have um, some tickets available. So definitely um, get on top of that if you'd like to have that uh, small chat with Indy Young. All right, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Megan Rennie, who is the Director of Experience Design Research in Capital One. Uh, Megan has nearly 30 years of experience uh, learning about audience with the goal of designing solutions that change behavior, improve lives, and help a business achieve its goals. Her research knowledge and experience lean heavily toward the practical, especially in the area of understanding customers' unexpressed emotional needs. She believes strongly that the most valuable research is the research that fuels the pragmatic imagination. And I know that you guys are going to learn so much from her tonight. I'm honored to call her my coworker, and I'm excited for her to share her knowledge with you guys. And without further ado, I will hand it over to her and stop my share. Thank you, Lauren. Let me share my screen. Um, while I'm doing that, I'll just say how excited and privileged I feel to be here tonight and speaking to all of you folks. Um, this is a group that um, I've watched grow since the beginning and I'm just really proud of Jen, Lori, and Lauren and what they've done and how they've grown this group. Um, it's a big, um, it's of so much value to our local um, and community and environment and and now I see worldwide so that's super. Um, Anthony Zablocki, I'll tell Pat that you gave him a shout out and I'm super happy that you're on the other side of my screen um, as well as some other folks that I've worked with in the past so um, thank you for being here. Um, I've got a lot to cover tonight um, so I'm going to dive right in. Here's what we'll cover. 
And let's get through this introduction. Um, Lauren said a lot of what um, I would say to introduce myself. Um, but uh, a few other things that um, I think it's important for folks um, just starting out in UX, particularly in research, um, to know or for me to share um, is that um, I'm an English major. So for all of you liberal arts um, people out there who have found it hard to break into the job market, um, particularly in technical environments, um, take heart. Uh, people who are comfortable with ambiguity, um, people who can extract clarity out of confusion, people who communicate are going to be more and more in demand. That's especially true in design and especially true in design research. So um, take heart. You will, as a fuzzy, you will thrive in a techie environment. As uh, Lauren mentioned, I'm a huge proponent of people focus and the process and design deliverables that support that focus. Um, for some of my work in the customer research area, I did receive one of the highest internal awards at Capital One, um, and I'm really proud of the um, customer to life experience that my team and I put together um, a little while back. Um, and speaking of teams, I am probably most proud of the teams that I've worked on. Um, and been really privileged to lead and the way that um, they have been able to keep the customer at the center of their vision and about their work. Um, and also I feel like I need to say, I am not proud of my visual design skills and you'll see why as we move through this presentation, it's really bare bones, but hopefully it is clear um, and it will get you content that you'll be able to use in the future. All right, so let's keep going. Um, I grabbed this visual um, from Adrian and Ashley's uh, presentation that they did a couple months back just because I thought it was so clean and elegant. Um, and I wanted to show you where research method selection falls in the overall research price process. Um, selecting a method is part of um, designing your research. Um, you need to understand uh, what you're trying to learn, um, develop an approach for learning it, and then you select your methods. And so we'll get into that here um, in more detail immediately. Um, we're going to cover context. Um, context is all important um, when you are developing a research approach. Um, we'll then look at a couple of frameworks. Um, a few of you, maybe many of you, are familiar with these two frameworks that I've selected today. But what they really are are mental shortcuts for um, understanding and getting clear and aligned with your teams on where you are in the design process and then what research methods are most useful for that point in the process. Then we'll look at some specific methods. Um, again, this is not about coaching on these specific methods. I'm going to be providing an overview of what these um, very tried and true methods are good for. But then I'll also talk a little bit about how they can be used in combination um, to get um, either more out of that method itself um, or to provide a more well-rounded um, 3D view almost of your customer, if you will. And then time permitting, we'll go into a few scenarios that I've put together um, and developed research approaches for. Um, if we don't get to that, because I'm pretty long on content, that content will definitely be available in the downloadable deck that um, Lauren and team will post uh, later. All right. Oh, well, um, and as I mentioned, this presentation today really just scratches the surface on selecting research methods. Um, I hope that it serves as a thought starter for you and really an impetus to learn more. All right, let's talk about context. So context plus constraints are the things that are going to, um, if you understand them fully, and understand how to work within them are what's going to set your research up for success. 
And then successful research design um, will set you up well to meet your goals. The first thing you need to understand, and we all know this, but even when you're senior, it's still true. Um, you have to understand your audience. Who are you going to be delivering the results for and to? Um, you are, you're probably not a team of one. You're probably not doing it just for yourself. Um, but it is always true that you are not your audience. So know who your audience is, what they're expecting to see, what they're not expecting to see, um, what level of knowledge they have about the area that you're um, delving in to learn about. Um, and then also, and this is really important, what kind of misconceptions or preconceptions or assumptions do they have um, that either you're going to need to um, design to uh, debunk um, or, you know, if they're very firmly held, then you might be working um, in some ways to uh, confirm them. Constraints. There are some obvious ones on here, time, money, um, those assumptions. Um, but you should also think about what you want your deliverables to look like on the other end. Um, if you think that your storytelling is going to be more convincing and your results um, more believable, if you have audio clips or video clips, or if you have a lot of hard data and quantity, um, then those things ought to affect um, the methods that you select to, um, to do your learning. Not necessarily define them, but you should take those into account. Obviously, the tools that you have at your disposal are going to be a constraint. And then um, these last two, I think, are more and more top of mind, um, especially when you're doing research in areas um, like finance or like healthcare. Um, the sensitivity of your topic, um, privacy concerns, and then ethics and the law surrounding the type of data that you can collect um, are things that need to be taken into account when you design your research. Um, we could do a whole other session on topic sensitivity, ethics and the law, um, and uh, that would be um, like fertile and new territory for a lot of us. And then finally, um, what desired actions do you want people to take on the other side? What kind of outcomes are you looking for? Um, is your research designed to get a small number of answers, maybe even a single answer to inform a quick fix, like a usability problem? Or do you want it to have a wider ripple effect and um, longer, longer shelf life, some longevity? Um, those things will also need to be baked into um, your research approach and the methods that you select. As Lauren mentioned, I believe strongly that the most valuable research that we can do is the research that somebody does something with. Um, and in order for people to hear what you're saying and take it away and feel compelled to act upon it, it needs to be valid. If it's valid, it will be believable. Um, it will imply action. Um, there will be some things in your storytelling that are just begging to be done, whether it's learning something else um, or actually doing an experiment um, that would help you understand the market or your, um, the validity or value of your solution out in that market. Um, it will be durable. Um, people will be able to believe those results, um, at least for the, the specified period of time um, over which you have um, looked at the data. And not to be forgotten, no pun intended, um, your results need to be memorable. Um, they need to be delivered in a way that really stick in people's imaginations. Um, so that um, they can make uh, sound decisions on their own when you're not around. And uh, ideally, they wouldn't even have to pull up your research report or your deliverables. Your storytelling would be so strong. And strong storytelling is absolutely reliant on strong data. 
All right, so let's look at a few guiding frameworks. Um, <laughs> my rudimentary drawing capabilities here. Um, a framework, as most of you know, is really just a tool um, that helps you focus and align. Ideally, it's visual. You know, we've got the continuum over here, two by two, um, X, Y axis, but it helps you organize your information or ideas. And the goal is to help you think more clearly about a problem um, and help you home in on what you want to learn um, so that you can tackle it more easily, get buy-in. Um, that's another reason that having a visual and applying a visually applied fr framework is valuable. People can look at it and ponder it um, and get on board with you. And then it also helps keep you honest. Um, when you're in the, the throes of research design and you <laughs> are tempted to throw a bunch of different methods um, at the problem. If you look back at a framework and which methods are particularly well suited to that part of the design or research process, um, you can kind of um, self monitor and keep yourself honest. So let's look at a couple. This is that design thinking wayfinder that I mentioned. Um, I find that this one is especially useful when not everyone is a designer. Um, when um, they're not necessarily familiar with design process, but they certainly do know what their goal is and what types of questions they're trying to answer. Um, it's oriented around broad research goals. So do you want to gain both broad and deep understanding of people and people in an environment? Um, you don't know what the need is and you don't know what the solution is, then you're in this upper right build empathy quadrant and interviews, observation, being in the environment, as well as uh, learning from secondary resources could be really valuable um, when you're trying to build empathy. Um, or are you in the idea generation space? Um, you know your needs, but now you're focused on figuring out like what the possible solutions might be. Then you're in the explore ideas quad quadrant and techniques, methods like concept testing, service storming, um, which if you attended the session probably about a year ago, um, Lena and uh, Becca Hummel um, did a really great workshop on service storming, um, as well as competitive analysis can be really useful there. Um, if you have a known need and some potential known solutions, but you need to get data on you know, what's going to fly, what's really going to be effective, then you're in this make to learn space and methods like concept testing, co-creation, um, desirability studies, A-B testing are all going to be valuable. And then finally, if you're in this um, quadrant that is labeled find a need, um, which can sound a little bit pejorative, um, this is sometimes the quadrant known as um, a solution in search of a problem. Um, but you know, sometimes somebody just has a great idea and we need research to figure out if that great idea is gonna be valuable to anybody. Um, so if uh, that's what you're trying to do, um, then some of the methods in this find a need um, quadrant could be especially, especially valuable to you. It feels weird not to ask if people have questions as we go along, but Lauren has assured me that people put them in the chat and that, um, that they'll come later. Um, so please do that. Um, the second framework is the double diamond. Um, and this is a very um, traditional design um, framework um, that many of you might have seen. Um, the two diamonds are um, very uh, straightforwardly labeled, um, build the right thing, I'll go ahead and advance. Um, which uh, those of us who have been around for a while, like used to call discovery. Um, and then build the thing right. Like once you've determined what the right thing is, you need to know how to build it right. Um, and that's uh, kind of um, aligned with a traditional design phase. Um, the diamonds are uh, 
are, are diamonds because they're communicating that you need to flare um, to learn widely, um, perhaps probably doing formative or generative, uh, generative research. Um, and then focusing, once you've got a broad set of things that you might do, focusing to evaluate those options. Um, and that's true whether you're in discovery or design. So both of these will work and you know, um, it's really just a matter of um, what feels better to you um, and to your teams um, and which, uh, you know, as most tools, uh, the right tool is the tool that gets you the um, results that you're looking for. All right, so let's dive into some methods. I'm gonna talk a little bit just up front about um, using more than one method, um, also known as multi-method research. Um, it's just what it says, um, where you employ two or really ideally three methods um, sometimes that can feel like a super luxury. Sometimes being able to employ one method feels like a luxury, but if you can work it to be able to um, employ one or, excuse me, two or more methods um, to answer a research question or set of questions, um, it is going to increase both your confidence as well as your audience's confidence in the ac accuracy of your results because having more than one data source and more than one and sources of different types of data allow you to triangulate. And that's just a fancy word for um, getting some quantitative data, some numbers data that tells you one thing, um, following it up or parallel pathing qualitative research um, to get answers to the same questions um, so that you can then see it's like, yeah, numbers tell us this. And guess what? Individual people talking to us tell us the same thing. Um, so using more than one method really allows you to build a really well-rounded picture. And like I said before, gives you more ammunition for your storytelling. Um, you will almost always have numbers people in the room, plus people who, um, for whom individual stories and hearing directly from people really resonates. You will also almost always have people in the room who want substantiation from outside authorities. So um, as we'll see here, um, if we get into the scenarios, doing a survey plus some empathy interviews plus some secondary research can be a really powerful combination for um, getting an accurate answer to a question and then um, conveying that answer to your audience. It's all about ripple effect. Um, and then just real quickly about types of data gleaned from research. Um, they very broadly fall into two camps, um, what people say and what people do. Um, attitudinal data is uh, the data that shows you how people feel, um, usually expressed verbally. Um, what a person thinks, also usually expressed verbally. Um, the reasons to gather it are for patterns and trends, like are we seeing um, uh, certain emotions um, overtake a uh, certain population at a certain time. Um, so you'd want to know broad trends, um, but really it can also inform additional inquiry. Um, so you're people are saying they're feeling a certain way. How is that um, manifesting in their behavior? Um, as we have um, said a lot in the research community, like what a person does is often a better indicator of what their drivers, both what they think and what they feel are than what they say they think and what they feel. Um, so, um, gathering behavioral data using methods that get you behavioral data um, is really important. However, if that's all you have, it can be easy to misinterpret because people aren't there telling you, you know, they're not there doing a voiceover um, when you're observing them 
you know, I don't know, go from the kitchen to the living room to the kitchen to the living room. You can make hypotheses about why they're doing that. Um, but you need to be able to um, triangulate that behavioral data so that um, you're not misinterpreting it and wasting time in your research. All right, so I'm gonna lean on the double diamond pretty heavily um, as my framework um, for orienting as we go through some of these individual methods. Um, and we're gonna move left to right. So um, in the flare portion of the build the right thing diamond, um, three methods that I have found really effective um, are uh, what I'm, very loosely lumping together um, into observation. Um, a lot of, like if you're an ethnographer out there, you could say they're not all forms of ethnography, but what they really are, they're all forms of getting out in the world and observing what's going on. So I'm gonna treat them um, together. Um, for the purposes of expediency tonight. Then we'll also talk about interviews and competitive analysis. So like I said, um, all of these observation techniques are about immersing yourself in an environment in order to understand what's going on. Um, they get you behavioral data and qualitative data. Um, and you use these when you need to understand the bigger picture. Um, you don't want just a single snapshot in time um, and you don't want just self-reported data, but you want to see for yourself what's going on. Um, this is especially uh, valuable if you're doing something like task analysis. I mean, I don't know how you do task analysis without doing some kind of observation, but if you want to understand all of the steps somebody takes to get a particular job done, then doing some form of observation will be um, very necessary. It's not real great when you're time constrained or need like, to observe like 50 people in 50 different environments. Um, that can be very daunting. Um, and it can be hard to conduct without affecting the results. Um, you're an observer in that environment. And so you would need to be um, very careful about not inserting yourself um, in a way that would um, lead people to do something differently than they might do otherwise. Um, it goes really well um, with uh, interviews, if you have the luxury of that. To go deeper, um, you can talk to people um, after they've completed a task or even in the process if you um, feel confident that um, you can do that without affecting the results. So speaking of interviews, um, this is a uh, method that we tend to lean on very heavily. Um, it's very versatile um, and can get you a lot of data. Um, it's really good when you want depth of understanding and nuance um, because you can take the time with the individual to dig deeper. Um, it's also great for um, getting audio or video um, if you'd want to use that in your storytelling. Um, it's not great for statistical significance. Um, you'd have to do so many interviews to do that that um, it's just not practical. Um, kind of like uh, observation, it can be hard to not affect your results. Um, you need to be very conscientious about injecting um, your own point of view um, and bias into the process of the interview. Um, but um, something that I have found um, is a really effective technique, um, and you can learn more about this in um, some of the resources that um, are gonna be posted on the um, website later, um, is directed storytelling. Um, it can be tempting in the context of an interview to lean into territory of, well, tell me what you would do if. Um, and like I said before, people almost never do what they say they're gonna do. And you're asking them to predict their future behavior as well. So 
um, using a technique like directed storytelling, which in which you ask them to tell the, tell you about a time when that's kind of analogous to the um, situation that you're envisioning, um, like maybe your solution um, meeting a need for, can be um, really effective. It primes the conversation um, and also um, gets you a closer to accurate. It's still self-reported and based on memory but a closer um, estimation to um, what their behavior is likely to be um, in the environment that you're gonna create for them. Uh, competitive analysis, um, super important, honestly, and uh, not done enough, in my opinion. It can be hard to do, um, but I think it's very, very important that you understand the landscape or the environment um, that you're planning um, to place a solution in. Um, it's great and absolutely, honestly, unnecessary for understanding real areas of opportunity. Um, the white space, if you will, um, where you might be able to um, design a solution and differentiate um, that solution in your company. It's not good for directly informing design. People can be um, very tempted to just copy what a competitor's doing. Um, so you should be very conscientious about that not being your goal in doing the analysis. Um, you need to do the analysis with some very well thought out evaluation criteria. Um, you can do uh, a scan just to understand the space, but this method really yields results when you're looking at the competitor's solution and evaluating it against things that either are your differentiators or your experience principles or your design principles and understanding how that competitor is or is not um, delivering on those criteria. Um, it can go really well also with a heuristic or expert evaluation. So um, let's say that you've identified a small set of competitors who have a really good solution in your space. Um, you can have somebody look at those and evaluate them for essentially weaknesses or chinks in their armor um, that then you could prioritize as you move forward into design. All right, so focusing in uh, the discovery or the build the right phase. Um, phase. Uh, we're going to look at just a few here. Um, so um, effective methods during flaring are observation. Oh, sorry. Ooh, I kind of screwed up my slides here. Um, Co-creation, really good for focusing, desirability testing. And then um, once uh, you're in that space, also surveys and uh, secondary research. So let's get into those. Um, Co-creation or co-ideation, um, also known sometimes as participatory design, um, can be super fruitful and really fun. Um, that's when you get your actual users involved in generating ideas um, for meeting their needs. Um, it's not good for validating a solution. If you go into this open-ended um, session or this uh, generative space with people and it becomes clear, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're really just looking for them to um, tell you how great a certain idea you have is, um, you might as well have not done the research at all. Um, you're going to come out with um, results that um, are not believable. Um, again, it can be challenging to avoid bias when you're using this method. Um, you don't want to lead people um, towards the thing that you think um, might be the answer. You really want to be open-minded um, in order to solicit um, the widest range um, and uh, the most creative um, ideas out of the group. 
Um, and this can go really well with interviews as well. Um, so in addition to the um, uh, design like generation of, or excuse me, design session like generation of ideas, um, you can do some follow up interviews and ask people a little bit more about um, what they were thinking um, and why they came up with the ideas that they did. Um, a desirability study um, is a method that I think is going to be more and more valuable um, as we move into um, the area where a truly differentiated solution is going to be one that elicits um, the best, the most positive um, emotions out of folks. Um, you know, you've, let's say you've got a host of different, say, rideshare apps, um, but you might choose to use the one that makes you feel the best about um, engaging with that service and with that company. Um, desirability testing can be a way to get at um, whether the solution that you're proposing or envisioning is actually going to get the um, emotions um, that you want um, people to have um, when they're interacting with that, um, that solution. It's great for understanding first impressions. Um, so uh, you can put a solution or an envisioned solution in front of someone and um, just ask them um, how they're feeling at certain um, key moments that matter throughout the solution. Um, it's not good for proof about the effectiveness of the solution. It's not a usability test. It's not, um, you know, a task completion test. It really is about like how they're feeling as they um, interact with the stimulus. Um, it can be prone to um, bias from the outside. Um, since you're asking people to tell you how they feel, um, if they've had a terrible day, then they might feel a little bit worse about anything that you put in front of them um, than they might otherwise. And if they've had a great day, they might feel better about anything you put in front of them than they might otherwise. Um, so you would need to be careful to um, like really set the context well and uh, give people an opportunity to kind of like down regulate um, before they start the test. Um, it goes well with user interviews and particularly the think aloud technique. Um, just um, when people like say, well, this makes me feel like really happy. You want to know why you don't want just to know just that they feel happy. Surveys, um, we lean on these really heavily as well. Um, they get you primarily attitudinal data, um, unless you're ga gathering behavioral data on people's um, taking of surveys, um, and they get it uh, in quantity. Um, you should use these when you need a lot of quantifiable data um, relatively quickly, and they're great for going broad um, and gaining direction. Um, I like to say that surveys are directional and then you need to follow it with another method um, that helps you dive deep and really helps you understand the whys behind the answers. Um, they can be hard to analyze, um, sometimes just because of the quantity of responses. Um, but also if you've put a lot of open-ended questions in there, then those can be very time consuming um, to analyze and code. Um, one way to get that kind of um, qualitative feedback um, without having a lot of text data that you have to analyze can be doing something creative like um, using a platform like usertesting.com that allows you to record and uh, launch the survey within it. When somebody launches the survey, you can then ask them to explain why they're answering the way they're answering as they take the survey. Um, we have used that creative combination um, to some pretty good effect um, on the teams that I've been on. Secondary research. 
Um, as I mentioned, um, it is great um, for both understanding uh, what others have learned before you, as well as um, like really rounding out uh, a point of view um, that is starting to emerge from the research that you have conducted. Um, it's good for focusing your own research. Um, you know, if you're investigating a certain space and you can understand or gather authoritative research that answers this set of questions, it then allows you to focus on the ones that haven't been answered. Um, it's not good. I mean, this is no substitute for your research with your actual users. Um, it's easy to cherry pick for insights. It can be very tempting to find uh, substantiating research um, that supports your point of view, um, but that's really kind of an abuse of the technique. Um, but it can go very well with stakeholder interviews. So, um, you know, let's say you're talking to leadership, um, they are expressing the desire to go in certain directions, um, but there are certain things that they don't know. You can follow that with a secondary research review and come back with answers. Um, it, you can also use it to get better informed on a space before you go into stakeholder interviews um, so that you have a perspective on uh, the problem um, that you're going to talk about um, and are able to offer that in the context of the interviews um, and maybe even help them refine their thinking. And then usage data analysis. When is it a bad time to look at site analytics data? Never. That's why I put it across the whole of the double diamond. Um, so if you are able, you should always be looking at the data that the system gathers on itself about how people are interacting with it. Um, sometimes this is called automated remote research, but that seems like not that great a description to me. Um, it gets you behavioral data and it can get it for you in quantity. Um, and uh, you should use it when you need to begin to understand where users are or are not meeting with success in your solution. Um, it's not good for understanding why. You can't really, you know, if somebody drops off at a certain point in your experience, um, you're not going to know why. You can have some hypotheses. Um, and if you pair it with something like a usability test or an expert or a heur heuristic review, um, you can get really close to the answer probably, um, but it is not going to give you that why. Um, and um, your system has to be set up in order to gather that data. Um, if you can't get site analytics data um, or can only get it sparsely, um, it can really lead you down um, a path that you wish you had not gone down because, you know, old adage, garbage in, garbage out. All right, let's move into uh, the design phase, the build the thing right. Um, we're only going to talk about a few here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about concept validation um, because that is um, a very uh, useful method. I've talked a little bit about Think Aloud. Um, tree testing and card sorting, I have not done individual slides on, but as I mentioned, um, there's a wealth of um, advice and uh, information on those two methods out there, and there will be in the um, resources that we provide online. So concept validation, um, we use this a lot as well. Um, and really what it is, is placing low fidelity stimuli, um, wireframes or design comps, um, not the designed thing, not the fully designed thing, um, in front of users to get their feedback on um, its strengths and weaknesses. Um, it can get you both attitudinal and behavioral. Um, attitudinal for sure, because people will tell you what they think. You can sometimes use this in a uh, usability testing kind of way. 
um, but be careful. It doesn't represent actual usage. And you have to do a lot of um, either like one-off pathing in the stimulus that you develop um, or do a lot of talking yourself um, to kind of retract people when they don't react the way that you thought that they were going to to your stimulus. Um, so you have to uh, be pretty careful in the way you apply this, this method. Um, it's not great for getting definitive answers because I said it's not the actual solution. Um, and it can be hard to conduct without inserting your own bias. Um, but it can be done. We do it a lot. All right, so let's move into um, this last half of the design diamond. Um, I will dive uh, a little bit deeper into several of these techniques. Um, the first, usability testing. Um, so um, we're all pretty familiar with usability testing. Often when um, you're a researcher, um, you <laughs> spend a lot of your time um, uh, designing and conducting usability tests on things that have already been built. Um, I put built in quotations because often it's like built, built and launched. Um, other times it um, hasn't been launched. It's maybe just in staging and um, people want to get a read on um, whether people can actually do the things um, that um, it was designed to do. Um, it's great for identifying things that need to be fixed. It's not good for understanding the value of a solution. Um, I've used the analogy in the past that um, usability testing, um, it, it gets you data on whether it's usable, but not whether it's useful. So, you know, let's say you've got the greatest can opener in the world and you give it to somebody and ask them to open a can with it. And they're like, yeah, this is a great can opener. But then like most of your audience eats frozen dinners, it's not useful. It's very usable, but it's not useful. So you can't understand the value of your solution using usability testing. Um, it can be technically difficult to execute realistically. Um, you really want the testing to be done on um, the thing as it's gonna be launched. So t sometimes that's hard to get in front of people. Um, but it pairs really well um, with any kind of recording platform or think aloud. Um, just ask people to say what they're thinking as they uh, try to accomplish the tasks that you've asked them to accomplish using the solution. Um, expert or heuristic evaluations. Um, this is when you use an agreed upon set of criteria to evaluate um, an existing or a proposed solution. Um, it can get you lots of different types of data. Um, and it's especially valuable when you want to quickly identify things um, to change. Um, it is really great for identifying low hanging fruit. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes somebody who um, is well versed in either the problem space or the needs of the audience um, can look at something that you are considering um, launching and say, this doesn't align with their mental models um, or it doesn't support our, all parts of the process um, that then can give you direction for um, like refining the solution and doing um, more specific um, testing. And a heuristic review um, is um, also very tried and true. That's evaluating a solution against some of the classic um, usability criteria. Can people locate um, where they are in the middle of the solution? Um, does it allow for recovery from error? Things like that. So really great at identifying, uh, quickly identifying um, obvious things that need to be changed. And then finally, A-B testing. Um, this is when like you put two potential solutions out there in the wild and just see which one um, gets 
uh, more of something like conversion. Um, so uh, this is great for getting proof of performance because you've actually launched it. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever been on Amazon and could tell that they're, they're being part of an A-B test. That has happened to me quite frequently. It's like, oh, this is different. Oh, I'm not sure that this is really great. Um, you know that you're part of a, a, an A-B test um, when you um, see a solution that you're, you're not well acquainted with on a property that you visit all the time. Um, it's not great for understanding why. Um, and uh, not everybody's um, platform or solution is designed to allow for A-B testing. Um, so it may not even be possible. Um, for you in the space um, or company that you're supporting. All right, I'm going to do a time check with Lauren. I've used up pretty much all of my time. Um, do we want to keep going um, or do we want to shift to questions? So actually a bunch of the questions were about scenarios and real life things. And so I think okay. if you continue with the scenarios, that would be great. Um, there's been a ton of uh, requests for that. And so I'm gonna cut the um, networking down to maybe one question. So we'll still do it, maybe just won't spend as much time there. So we'll let you go through the scenarios, we'll do a Q&A and then we'll get to a, a shortened version of networking. Okay, sounds good, thank you very much. Great. All right, so um, this is a scenario that um, is pretty much bread and butter um, for a user experience researcher. Um, your team wants to understand how to increase the effect effectiveness of an existing experience. So you might have a research goal that is something like um, understand obstacles to purchase on our website so that we might convert 20% of browsers into buyers. Your audience, um, your interested parties are pretty much everyone. Um, the solution is launched. So design needs to know um, how the design might need to change. Product is very um, keen to get to better results and tech is very invested in understanding um, what might be down the pike for them in terms of changes um, to the actual build of the solution. Um, success looks like clear identification of the things that need to change to improve conversion. So how might you approach that? Well, here is one way. Um, first, you could look at your site analytics and look for things like drop off. Just what does the way that people are using the site now, what does it imply for uh, friction points or even walls that people are hitting? Um, that keep them from um, converting into a buyer. You could pair that with an expert evaluation. Um, so like I said, analytics don't get you the why usually. So you're gonna wanna have some hypotheses as to um, why people are getting stuck at certain points um, or why they're dropping off. Once you've kind of started to hone in and have some hypotheses, um, depending on um, how radical the changes are, um, here I'm kind of presuming that they're not super radical, that your team can envision some potential solutions, um, you could go into concept validation. So we have some strong hypotheses about um, where the sticking points are. Let's just do some new concepts and get them in front of people um, to get their feelings and um, like learn a little bit about whether these are going to um, overcome some of those sticking points. And then finally, um, once you've refined um, your concepts and arrived at uh, probably a couple of solutions will be in competition with each other, you could actually do some A-B testing and launch them on your website and see um, which of them um, wins, which of them gets better conversion. So this is one fairly typical scenario and uh, an approach um, that you could take um, to getting answers um, to achieving that overall goal. 
Um, something I didn't say at the beginning um, is that like there are so many ways to um, help a team achieve its goals. Um, while uh, what I'm putting in, especially in these scenarios, um, are some um, research approaches and combinations of methods that I've used in the past. Um, understanding your methods um, is really going to be foundational towards using them in combination to answering a question. So um, I just wanted to say that, that, that no approach is perfect, um, but there are some approaches and combinations of methods that are more likely to get you confident um, and valid data. All right, so here's another scenario. Um, identify, uh, and <laughs> I don't know what my headline says because my screen sharing thing's blocking it. Let's see if I can close it, there we go. Identify potential new offerings. Um, and this is actually a space um, that I think a lot of us are in right now. You know, you have um, offerings out there um, that are in the marketplace, but things are changing and we're in a space um, where people's feelings are often ruling the day. Um, and either you need to refine your existing solutions or there might be some new things that you wanna do, um, but um, you don't know whether you should do them or not. Um, often your audience um, at the other end of this question is gonna be leadership um, and um, to some extent, folks on your teams. And success looks like sparking their imaginations and gathering enough um, believable, valid data um, to tell a robust story um, that then uh, either supports proposals that you're ma you make or leads the team to have some specific ideas of how they want to proceed. So what might you do? Well, you have hypotheses about how people are feeling. You can do a survey just to see if you're right. Um, obviously, you would need to um, make sure that uh, you're doing it with a representative sample of your users. Um, but once you have, are confident um, in your recruiting um, and in your acceptance rate, um, you can have some confidence in um, the data actually accurately um, painting a picture of how people are feeling um, across that segment. Um, you can then pair it with empathy interviews to get into the why. You, people told you how they're feeling but you don't understand the full why. Um, so you could pair that with empathy interviews and like I mentioned, use that directed storytelling technique um, to, um, for example, get them to tell you about a time um, when a company stepped in when they were in a difficult situation and really helped them accomplish X. Um, that can help you avoid um, that, uh, that uh, unfruitful territory, ultimately unfruitful territory of acting, asking people to predict their behavior. Um, and then you could follow that up um, with a desirability study on some potential solutions. Um, what you heard is that there's a need for solutions that make people feel a certain way. Put some stimulus in front of them and see if, um, you can get some direction on whether these things that you're considering are actually leading them to feel the way um, that you would like them to feel on the other end. And our last example, and I'm gonna bring back the design thinking wayfinder, um, is to understand where a potential online experience can support an existing offline experience. So um, an, an analogous situation would be like you, your client or your um, company operates very traditionally in a brick and mortar space, but they know that they need to start to move into digital. They need to support that brick and mortar space or even move parts of that um, like in-person experience 
into um, the digital realm. So um, your goal here, or one of the goals, could be to understand unmet needs in an existing experience. So um, for example, you're shopping in a store, but it is very difficult to get enough, uh, and there are solutions out here like this, um, so I'm just gonna pick something that we're all familiar with, but I want a bunch of comparison data. I'd like to be able to compare these products that are on the shelf in front of me in a really robust way. Can't really do that in the store very well, but you can certainly do that online. Um, so that's an example of an unmet need um, that you may be able to meet in the digital space. Um, success is identifying those um, failure points or even just places where there are friction um, that um, a digital solution might be able to alleviate. And um, often in um, a scenario like this, um, leadership especially will be very excited about the, their ideas. Here's the things that we need to do. We just really need to like take this territory. And so they have a lot of commitment um, to uh, solutions that they've already envisioned um, that you need to be um, fully aware of. Um, some additional constraints can be that you might have limited access to that offline environment. Um, and even if you were to get into it, um, your presence can't interfere with the results. So how much you construct your research to um, meet the needs in this scenario? Well, first, you could do some secondary research um, to really uh, get a clearer picture about whether some of those assumptions um, whether um, they're held by leadership or even um, by yourself are accurate. Um, is this a real need? Um, are other companies trying to meet it? That's kind of a, a slant on competitive research. Um, and if they are, um, are those solutions being successful? Where are they being successful? Where are they not being successful? That can help you identify that white space. Um, then you can do observation with selected partners, um, focusing on those areas of opportunity. So getting into the field and really looking at that, those parts of the experience that um, you now have a more well-grounded hypothesis about um, there being a need to meet. And then you could follow it up with a survey. Um, we think that these things um, could be uh, valuable. Um, let's do a survey um, to see if, in fact, what I've observed with my few partners um, are widespread enough, that those problems are widespread enough um, for us to find that um, territory that could be valuable um, to enter into. Um, and you could even use that survey um, to do a, a little bit of lightweight um, interrogation of some ideas that you have for meeting those needs. Again, you have to be careful not to ask people to predict how they might behave, but you can certainly um, use a survey to get reactions to um, certain things or ideas. Um, that, is, that is it. Um, in closing, um, your research is valuable if you have fueled somebody's imagination and that you've given them some really practical input um, to do some things with. Um, that, that input needs to be valid, valid, believable, actionable, durable, and memorable. And if you've done all that, then as I said, like if you've gotten to the right result, you've used the right methods um, in the right ways. Um, and uh, congratulations to you. Um, and that's all I got. So thanks everyone. Awesome, thank you so much, Megan. That was such a great overview of so much information in, in a short amount of time. So we really appreciate you taking the time and putting that together and distilling it down. Um, I know it can't have been an easy <laughs> task. Um, and then for everybody who asked on the chat, yes, we're recording. Yes, we'll post the slides. Um, I know that was a ton of information, so um, we'll get to see it all later. Um, and thanks to everybody for posting questions as well. There's a ton of great ones in the chat. So I'm going to do my best to, to get the ones that a, a bunch of people had. 
Um, and so we'll get the Q&A started now. Okay. Keep the questions coming through the chat as well, um, and, I'll, and I'll try to my best to monitor. Um, one of the questions that came up toward the end with your scenarios was, mm -hmm. if you're limited on time or resources, budget, um, how do you prioritize? You know, you may want to do the triangulation in multiple different methods, but if you only have time for one, how do you, how do you pick? Well, I think it all first, you know, the, the first bullet in that list of criteria for successful research is validity. You have to pick a method that gets you data that you can believe in. So if, um, if the question is one about how widely an opinion is held, then you have to you have to go survey and you have to have it well designed and maybe that's your one shot at answering that question um if uh the question is like we've got a couple of different design directions and we really just need to kind of do a litmus test on like thumbs up thumbs down from users then you would try to or orchestrate some quick and dirty um, concept validation. Um, maybe even doing it online. I mean, I say maybe. We kind of have to do everything online right now. Um, so uh, get a group of people who um, ideally are your actual users and representative of your user base. But if you can't get them, then you get people who are close to them. You get close to the customer um, folks. We do this um, some in our space. Um, if you have a, a and for example, a sales force that is super well acquainted with your customer base, you can use them as a proxy audience um, because you're gonna get um, access to them easier than you are um, to your um, actual customers in a short amount of time. Um, it's a hard question to answer um, shortly because you have to get creative. Um, but uh, if your research isn't valid, um, you, neither you nor anyone that you're speaking with um, can be confident in it. Yeah, like you mentioned before, kind of garbage in, garbage out. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another question that came up several times was about, um, you know, if your your dev or design team or leadership are used to doing the same methods over and over again, mm -hmm. how do you convince others to try different methods um, in reaching the goals? Well, I mean, I think it's. Um, really just about making your case. And there are like so many um, authoritative um, resources out there that like really lay out the strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, that d do in a very exhaustive and authoritative way what I tried to do um, in a, roughly an hour here. Um, there are so many resources out there um, that, you know, um, I can't show you one because it'll seem like an endorsement, but there's one that's going to be in the resources that um, is actually oriented around phase and also um, has a really handy rubric um, for like when to use and what it will get you, um, which is, you know, I kind of stole that um, uh, framing. Um, but, uh, there's just like a ton of resources out there that you can like bring in to say, I think we should do this instead of this. As Megan just mentioned, I will also be po posting a list of resources that are related to this talk, um, not specifically endorsed by, by Megan or Capital One, but we'll be posting them um, as well. So thanks Megan for reminding me of that. Um, so another question came up about, you know, if you as a researcher have not been able to do all of these research methods, like they haven't come up in specific projects mm -hmm. or, um, you know, you just haven't had the opportunity, mm -hmm. what's the best way to practice a research method if you haven't had a project that specifically needs it? That's a great question. Um, 
what my team has done and, you know, what my, my team of researchers um, and like, I so love them and we're so part of design culture that we like look at everything around us and say, that's a design problem. So you can practice on yourself. Like if you are trying to figure out like, um, like whether you can get budget for a certain tool um, in some ways, like that's probably not a good example, but ask yourself, is it a design problem? How would I learn about the answer to this? And then just try a technique that maybe you haven't um, used before. So you can learn on yourself. <laughs> it's very low risk. Um, if you get in and you find that you're not confident um, in your ability to, to use that method, um, or uh, that on the other end, like you can't be confident in your results, um, you have learned on yourself um, and, um, you know, low risk of embarrassment and you can redo it. You can redo it because um, you're your customer. Um, I think forums like this are also excellent. Um, you can uh, perhaps get a small group of people together who um, want to do, um, I'm picking service storming, which is a bad example for now because it's best when done in person, maybe only really validly done in person. Um, but um, like come up with a fake project and um, just try to employ those methods um, to move through that project. You'd have to have um, a user base that you could get access to um, but that could be one way um, to experiment. Great. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat related to the time that it, that it takes to run different mm -hmm. projects. And especially in the scenarios that you laid out where you, you want to do multiple or mm -hmm. you know, triangulate. Can you talk more about, um, you know, the timelines involved? No. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, golly, that's a great question too. You're going to make me like survey my memory um, to come up with an accurate answer. Um, I would say that it's pretty hard to execute um, on to answer a question use and design an approach and use your method within the context. You could probably do, you can do a lot of things in a sprint. Doing things in less than a sprint is pretty rough. Um, so again, you would need to, uh, and this is where if you're in an environment um, where you have um, some things already stood up um, that can help you, like uh, you might want to put into s some work into um, like having a group of customers who are always ready um, for you to do research with them, um, like an insider community or um, just a panel. Um, you might want to stand up some things um, that you can go to um, when your timeline is really short, like have templates in place um, for interview guides, um, have um, a how-to on how to launch a user testing.com um, test um, in place um, so that um, when you're ready to research, you've got all of the supporting things um, there at the ready um, in order to make sure that you can do that um, as quickly as possible. That's Great, we got to Really oh, sorry, hard. Megan. Sorry, I was just going to say that's really hard. Um, you don't necessarily want to uh, have your first answer be like you want this to be quality and believable, right? So that we only have to do it once, right? Um, but that that's kind of the first answer is to say like this is how much time it will take to do it right, so that you can believe it, and we don't do it need to do it again. Um, and like have thought through your approach so that that's supportable. Um, that really is the, the first thing to do there. Great. And just a really tactical follow-up question is when you refer to a sprint, how long um, of a, a sprint are you talking? 
a sprint is usually two weeks. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Some people in the chat were Sorry. saying current job is two weeks. Some are doing a month. Yeah. So oh, okay. people do it different ways. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so there was a question about, um, you know, which, which are the best methods to use when you want to know the value of a solution? Cause you know, during your talk, you, you, you mentioned that, um, some things would help you understand other parts, but not the value mm -hmm. of it. So talk more about the value. Um, that's a hard question too. Um, generative techniques that get you really well grounded in broad user needs and then more specific user needs um and also that help you understand where and how those needs are being met so i would say things like observation um competitive analysis um are two that i would lean on very heavily um like understand what's actually going on in the world and then marshal all of the resources that you can um, from authoritative um, resources to uh, help you understand who's doing what um, a lot of value and this is probably not the answer that people are looking for but um, there are so many solutions out there that are oriented towards um, people uh, actually completing a task or something like that. Um, so the real opportunity for differentiation is to do it in a way that's different or that delivers an emotional benefit that the um, way that the um, just kind of bare bones task oriented solution is not um, is going to be a pocket of um, untapped value and unmet needs. Um, so things that really get you at the um, unspoken um, are going to be the things that um, give you a clear picture of where there's an opportunity um, for you to dive in and add value in people's lives. Yeah, great answer. Sometimes I feel like people go really, really quickly to concept validation or usability before they yeah. dive deep into like, what are the, the real problems that we're actually trying to solve and how can that differentiate us? Yep. Great. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit. So we had a couple questions about um, either new folks getting into research um, or just some hiring related questions. So love to know what are the methods um, that are your personal must-haves when you're hiring a new researcher? That's a great question. Um, I definitely um, need to see evidence um, that somebody is able to uh, design a research plan um, that is geared towards uh, learning without bias. Um, right now, I'm particularly interested in people who can design and execute a survey well. Um, just selfishly, that is not an area of strength for me. Um, I can do it if I have to. And I think it's really hard to do really well. Um, so I like to see evidence that people are confident in their ability to design and analyze the results of a survey. Um, I also like to see um, that people uh, like have worked with um, a team, like that they haven't been a researcher of one who's used to getting a question, doing some research, and then throwing it over the wall. Um, I like to know that they always have in mind those people who are going to need to do something with the thing that the you know the answers that they're generating um it uh there's probably no better way to make sure that you are delivering value than to um like kind of turn around and look at yourself and say like what am i going to do with the answer to that question um if i ask it um, so people who are oriented that way very practically oriented right um, yeah, work, working within a team is, is 
so important um, in any UX team. So that that's great. Um, some other questions that came up are, you know, what advice would you give to people seeking to become a, a UX researcher or transitioning? You know, what, you know, what would you tell them or, or give them? Well, um, I'll share advice that may be hard to take if you're not already in this space, but um, the folks that I have worked with who have been really great researchers, um, a lot of them have come out of other design functions. Um, I've also worked with great researchers that came out of like an academic research background. Um, but um, it is so important um, in order to really offer value um, to have a, an idea of what people need for sound decision making on the other side, whether that's tech or whether that's design or whether that's um, product leadership stakeholders, um, that the more well equipped you are and understand um, the needs of those users, the better equipped you are to um, focus in on research to help them answer those questions um, and uh, focus on direction and effective solutions. Um, that reveals bias on my part. That was my story and the story of a lot of researchers that I've worked with. Um, so that's only one answer to that question. Um, I, Lauren, an, you answer that question because you came out of a, a, a more traditional research background and then entered into design. Yeah, and how did I know you were going to do that to me, Megan? I'm sorry, I didn't even mean to do that, but like, I, I don't mean to discount at all, at all, that path. It just hasn't been my path. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, I came from um, clinical research, which is much different than than UX research. And um, my strength was really in recruiting participants and managing data and writing protocols. So um, a lot of the same skills were needed. And so what I needed to learn was a lot of the UX specific methods. And again, this is like Megan said, my particular path, which is not the same for everybody, but I did a lot of self-study, um, you know, went to a bunch of conferences, did Nielsen Norman training um, and just read a lot um, and practiced. Um, so I was fortunate enough to um, have a job where I could practice with real life scenarios and teams and, um, you know, practicing in the real world was, you know, my, my way into becoming a researcher. So the more that you can practice, the better. Cool. Well, um, uh, Megan, I think that is the last uh, question. And so what I'm going to um, uh, leave with now is we're going to do the breakout rooms uh, for networking. And so um, Jen's going to help me set up the breakout rooms, but um, one, a couple quick announcements. Um, one, we're going to send a survey after this. So definitely tell us how you thought the event was. Um, but we're also going to include a question on which research method discussed tonight that you'd like a deep dive on. Um, Cause we went over a ton of things tonight and just skim the surface, like Megan said. And so um, please fill out this because it will help us plan our events for 2021. We wanna know what you wanna learn more about. Um, also, as I mentioned before, we're gonna post some resources um, on our website as well as the slides and the recording. Um, so all of these things will be available to you and you'll get an email um, following this event with information on how to access that. And then last, I really wanted to thank um, Megan for joining us tonight and, and preparing the slides. This was awesome. Um, there are a ton of questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, and so, you know, you see Megan's um, contact information here, um, connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, and then of course, join our Slack channel where uh, there's a lot of us um, asking and answering questions. So um, I know Lori posted some information on how to join our Slack channel, but that's also going to be in the follow-up email. Um, so some instructions for the breakout room is um, you're, you're